Hello? Hi, guys. So, um, I'm not sure this is started yet. We are but, live, uh, yeah. But I uh, really appreciate uh, um, you guys joining in. So, uh, so my name is Ronaldo Menezes. I'm a professor of data network science here at the University of Exeter. Uh, and um, we will we will have some uh, some 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 discussion related to 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 COVID and and human mobility. So I'll start the introductions here so that you know who who's in this call. So it is going to be a very informal. So Ricardo, please. Hi, I'm Ricardo Di Clemente. I'm a lecturer in data science at the University of Exeter, and uh, I'm part of this team that analyzes. Uh, the COVID, the change in mobility in the UK during the COVID crisis. So, Hugo? Hello, guys. I'm Hugo Barbosa. I'm a lecturer of computer science in the area of human dynamics and urban systems. And I'm also part of this team analyzing the mobility patterns during the COVID pandemic here in the UK. And Federico? Hi everyone, so my name is Federico Botta and I'm also a lecturer in data science um, here at the University of Exeter in the Department of Computer Science and I also was part of the team working on uh, on this project. Yeah, I really appreciate you guys, uh, the three of you joining and whoever is watching this. Uh, so we're going to just try to, to have an informal conversation. This is strange times in terms of COVID. Some of us at different I guess, levels are interested in this idea of human mobility. So I'll start actually with uh, with Hugo because I don't know if the audience actually understands what uh, human mobility actually is. So so what is the study of human mobility, Hugo? So can you define for us this? Yes. So human mobility is the area of research that investigates the patterns of behind human movements, and I'm talking not talk about new movements in the sense of dancing, but movements in terms of displacement, traveling behaviors. Uh, human migration, commuting patterns, and so on. Yeah, that's uh, in a broad sense what human mobility studies. So how did it all start? I Maybe mean, I think Ricardo has quite a lot of nice works on this. So how how did this come about? Um, and and so, uh, why, yes. why do we care, really? Oh, yeah, uh, we care about it because it could be very useful uh, for... Um, uh, urban planning uh, for understanding better uh, our interaction within the cities uh, to improve our daily life, like uh, for traffic, uh, or either to improve like uh, our social connection or like uh, the overall economic, uh, uh, understand better the economics of the cities. So there are very different uh, venues where you can apply these studies. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's actually, uh, it's becoming quite, quite popular. Uh, so we see if you actually look at the the number of publication over the years, right? Of course, there are seminal works of colleagues of ours, Marta Gonzalez and um, um, Xiaoming Song, but you can see that over the years, uh, the number of papers trying to somehow look at, uh, at uh, patterns and regularities has increased. So uh, uh, Federico, you, you're an expert, I guess, in data science as well. Um, so I guess one of the main concerns people have is all right, so what kind of data are those guys using to do this? And I guess I will open this uh, for everybody a discussion in terms of uh, uh, privacy. So should, should people be concerned that we are tracking them? Or, or... But what, what is the connection between this and data science in general? Yeah, I think this is a, this is a very good question. Um, I think the, one of the reasons why I guess the studies of human mobility have been kind of picking up and growing in the last few years is because we have an increasing availability of data that we can use to study human mobility. So I guess traditionally, I think this would be rather difficult to study because it's hard to know where people are and how they move and you know when they move and where they go. I guess, as we all know, recent years we have, I mean, everyone has smartphones that produces lots of uh, digital data, it contains location data, GPS coordinates. We use social media, which often leave um, footprints of where we are. And so the connection between data science and study human mobility comes from the fact that we have this huge availability of data sets which contain to an extent or another um, data on where we are and where we how we move around. And so we I guess as you know data scientists can use this data and extract information to understand patterns as Hugo and Ricardo were saying about you know regularities how we move around you know how uh you know on 
in, in our cities, we, we commute, for instance, uh, how traffic could behave, uh, and many other many other uh, features there. So let me let me continue here on this because I'm yeah. maybe play a little bit of a skeptical one here, right? So, so we discussed. Um, I think Ricardo mentioned this idea of traffic. So don't we know about this already? We know traffic is bad in the morning and traffic is bad in the evening, right? So, so what else are we trying to look? I mean, is there, is there, is there a secret that if I live at eight o'clock and I live in London, then I'm stuck in traffic for a long time? No, of course it's not. A, so I, th I think the I think the ball. So of course it's not it's not a secret. And then you can look around yourself and have already a grasp of the entity of the traffic and the dynamics. The problem is that we are all together. That movie that we are moving inside a in, in, in system, a very complex system as it is the B city. For example, the city of London. So the idea is that uh, is it possible to assess the flow of all the people together and how they interact all together? If you imagine that in the 60s and the 70s, after they they were performing. They, they were sending people across the, sea, the streets uh, counting person uh, or counting either. I think uh, if I was, uh, when I was young in the 80s, they were the guy with the, the clock that was counting the cards that passed through the cross. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, if you go around the UK, you can see that there are, there are not only bellocks, but there are either cameras that only count the flow of the cards. So there were a huge system and a lot of money spent on it. Then there was a lot of studies and surveys so there was a lot of money, but you have to pay people to do surveys and they, they, you have, it's going to be time and then you have to do every year to assess how does it change. So this uh, new dimension of data that uh, Federico just told us that is passively collected uh, can create a, a new dimension of information and actually can help us to save money in this analysis, provide new reliable data. Of course, it does not replace the survey or like demographic studies, because sometimes you don't have a perfect match of population and other complexity feature, but this can help to assess the situation. And a lot of times we can extrapolate from one location to another one, right? So even, yeah. so there are of course uh, certain uh, uh, locations in the world that perhaps do not have the same, the same resources, financial resources to, to collect the data let's put it this way. And then we can extrapolate from one city that have similar characteristics. In fact, I think Hugo, has some collaborations on, on looking at um, shapes of cities that I think in a, in a future conversation, we can probably include this um, a, as well. Uh, but what about the privacy, right? So I actually uh, threw the, the, the debate there, uh, nobody picked it up. So maybe some people listening to this and say, look, I'm now freaking out because I confess to you that I travel sometimes and I mention this to lay people uh, and I had this, actually one particular situation where somebody said, look, came after the, my talk and said, I, I really don't, not comfortable that you guys are looking at my cell phone and what I do. So, and I had to say, look, uh, we are not particularly interested on you, right? So it's not you, um, no, in no particular way. And it's no, I'm not, uh, it's not uh, a detriment to the person. You're not special in that sense that I'm just tracking you. It's, it's more from a, from a general uh, uh, regularity. So, but should people be concerned? Anyone wants to so to, to con talk about this? I can I can start with that. So basically, uh, what we do is uh, analyze global behavior. First, uh, we take the data only from people that de decide to share with us this data, following the GDPR, and uh, we are doing only this for research and for good purposes. So we are not doing any targeting, marketing, or anything at all. And anything at all. And then basically what we do is like we define aggregate features that we want to extrapolate for each user. And then we analyze these aggregated features, sometimes by the distribution, sometimes running simulations, sometimes a correlation. But we are always uh, capture aggregate information that are totally so we cannot trace the single user like uh, come back and say, okay, you were in particular location in the city. So we did, we don't have the possibility to do so. And after we want to do so, we, we don't care to do so. We want to assess the well-being of the city and how he is uh, impacted by the mobility or like uh, by social interaction. And we always uh, like take in consideration the privacy of everybody. Yeah, yeah I don't know what, yeah, uh, what the other guys- Maybe think. I can add something. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. yeah, sure. Yeah, because that's one of the missions, the, the dimension of the, of the, the data processing, but, um, I think it, the, the other side of the, the, the concern is that what's the, 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 the gain for society 
when you are talking about like um, the fact that we, like mobile phone companies they do collect these location data sets for billing purposes and but um, have been doing research on this mobility analysis from mobile phone tracer for um, quite a few years but um, and it has been always a debate in the area like what are the gains for society uh, because like up to um, until recently it was really um, well, some sort of like scientific gain, so to speak. But I think with this entire COVID pandemic, it became very clear the importance of how much we can learn and understand about human mobility patterns and, uh, and the importance for that in the context of, for example, preventing the spread of a disease like this one. So uh, throughout the world, like mobile phone data sets like this ones that we use, they are becoming increasingly important for governments and for um, um, uh, health uh, authorities for them to actually um, mitigate the impact of the pandemic and understand better the societies. I think um, nowadays is, I think at this moment, it's very clear what's the benefit for society, uh, for, um, for us academics and for the scientific community to have access to data sets like this one. It's actually a, a, an interesting point because we're going to talk about the reports that is uh, related to COVID, right? But even here in the UK, I think we, uh, some of us actually signed this, this, this letter asking for government to consider uh, social isolation at some point. And most of the people signing that were in complex systems and uh, somewhat related to, to human mobility because we can't claim, I mean, I think this made it more on the forefront uh, this COVID, but we know, of course, that colleagues of ours, uh, like Alex Vespignani, for instance, have been doing and using uh, models of human mobility in the past on, on avian flu and, and, uh, and uh, swine flu. Right? So it's now I think it, everybody seems to, to, to understand that this is the way forward, right? So that we can actually measure, which I guess the reports that you guys are going to, to discuss actually talks about. Uh, another point that I want, I'm interested in actually hearing from you is, is the fact that uh, maybe the, the general population doesn't understand that companies actually do, for the good of society, already track us. For instance, Google Maps and something. So there is a reason why we know there is a traffic somewhere, right? It's not by, by accident. Anyone wants to, to comment on that, that this, this is actually commonplace? Yeah, I, can, I think I can comment on that. The... Yeah, it's true that um, as we carry our mobile phones, um, companies, they, they, they can offer services for us. Um, I'm talking about like the, the, the context of pandemic, but Google Maps and other location services, they, when they collect information, um, of course, with the, the, when they use the authorize for them to collect this kind of information, they can, um, offer a different kind of services that they could be for. For example, offering information about traffic congestions, accidents, and, um, and, and it's, it's, it's a benefit for, for society because, I mean, um, this way we can actually use better the, the urban system. I, I remember that you asked the question about uh, the importance since we already know that London is gonna have traffic certain time of the day, but if we can, know beforehand where traffic's happening, what are the, the roads that are more congested, we can plan ahead and make more informed decision on what kind of path we're gonna take, actually minimizing the, the or alleviating the traffic congestion um, that was there in the first place. So yeah, I think these companies, they, um, they can offer interesting services when they have access to this kind of data. Yeah, and then dating sites, right? So, I mean, I mean there are so many, uh, I guess, applications that say there is somebody that maybe you are interested because you have a description nearby. So, and people seem to enjoy that. And that only comes about because there is some level, I guess, of, of, of quote-unquote tracking, but with the permission of the user. Federico, in relation, we talk about COVID, right? Um, can, you, can you tell us a little bit about the importance of mobility in face of this, this, this phenomenon that, I mean, we live in something like a, an event in a hundred years. Um, how, how, how does it, this, this mobility uh, tracking or mobility analysis help us on the COVID situation? Yeah, so I think 
I mean, this is a very um, interesting question, I think, to, to answer. I think, um, I mean, the, the thing with, with this current crisis and the, and the COVID pandemic is that it's kind of an unprecedented situation and it's a virus that we, you know, we didn't know anything about until, you know, a few months ago, really. And it's a virus for which we have no cure we have no vaccine and there is no immunity in, in the population because it's, it's a new disease. And so the way that you know, this um, disease is spreading, of course, is by people interacting with each other because we know that this disease, uh, you know, we catch the virus if we're in proximity um, of someone who, who has the virus as well. Right. And so clearly you know, the, the way that people move around and how much they interact is, um, is crucial for for how many people are um, exposed to potentially in the virus and therefore are potentially becoming uh, infected with it. And we know that mobility is important because the virus started um, in, in China, but then started spreading across the world because of course, you know, we live in a, we live in a world or till a few months ago, we lived in a world where traveling across the world was yeah, very easy. I don't remember and, what that is anymore. Yeah, I, I don't really remember how an airplane looks like. Mm-hmm. Um, so traveling, you know, was very easy and therefore we could make, uh, you know, we could go across the globe, you know, virtually, you know, in, in, in not much time at all, like a day, a day or two, and we could be on the other side of the world. And of course, this um, has a, is a key component of how the virus can spread. But also because the fact that, you know, we have no cure and no vaccine, you know, one of the main um, measures that we can take is a non-pharmaceutical measure, which is effectively reducing the possibility of these interactions happening and interactions between people often happen you know when people you know you go to the to a cafe to get a coffee or you go to the supermarket to do your weekly shop or you go i don't know to to buy some clothes or buy some books and just go for a walk so all of these different aspects of how we move around contribute to how uh, how likely we are to interact and therefore how likely we are to come into contact with someone who, who has been infected. So studying how and understanding how we move, how much we move or how little we move if we're subject to some measures like the ones that have been put in place, you know, kind of everywhere in the world really right, is crucial right. so, for, for this. So Ricardo, so, so we are fortunate that we have you here, right? Because we, I mean, we use in those reports of data that you had access um, um, before we had. So we want to say something about the data. Yeah, yeah. We can so, discuss the reports that we have. Practically, practically after the beginning of the COVID, after when uh, he started to become a more uh, worldwide uh, issue and start to, in Europe, it start with the Italy and Germany. And the most, uh, the country that get more at the beginning was like uh, Italy. So there were a, a couple of colleagues of mine, uh, actually there was a group of uh, Tizzoni from uh, HiFi that start to develop some uh, reports on the Italy de- development of uh, the COVID, how this was linked to mobility and uh, how we can assess this. So after the first report, uh, since they used to be in contact with the same company that they, uh, that they work uh, since five years, that is a Kubik, that is a data intelligent company that actually works with uh, collecting data from a GPS uh, mobile device for the people that uh, give their consents. And uh, he is working with uh, Data for Good uh, he has a data for good co- uh, pro- pro- uh, project. So I work with them uh, in order to assess traffic, uh, commuting behavior, uh, and for example, in another project, how to understand the attractiveness uh, of like uh, census uh, tracks that are more or less uh, neighborhood, in how this mm. neighborhood change during uh, the attractiveness of a neighborhood change during time. So I start to say, okay, maybe we can do something similar to the Italy researcher. And maybe they start to have some insight within the commuting behavior pattern and social interaction in UK. So since uh, I was in Exeter, uh, just we've been appointed, and then uh, and all of us actually work uh, in social behavior, human interaction, and uh, human mobility. Uh, we became became an, an, a natural group to work with. Uh, we had, uh, it's been joined of us uh, students, actually, of uh, Professor Ronaldo, that was Clodomir, and that helped us with uh, some of the analysis. And uh, we start to develop uh, this idea of this project in order to provide some insight and follow up of uh, how in UK the mobility has been impacted, uh, how the human interaction. Yeah, so, so and then we, we generated this, this first report. Um, um, maybe Federico or you can say something about this first report and what... The, what did we let we show? I mean, are we are we making recommendations at all in this, or or 
what what was the purpose of the first one? What are the main findings? Yeah, so I think as Ricardo said, we you know we were you know I guess thanks to Ricardo we we had access to this uh, this very interesting data set that you know we could use to study um, mobility of people across the UK. So we thought um, you know to, to to have a look at this data and see how the mobility was changing at the early stage of the COVID crisis uh, in the UK. So we started looking at this around I guess the end of March, um, beginning of April when. Um, you know, COVID was really picking up in the UK. So just to mention for people, maybe this and they're not aware of this, the UK entered the lockdown on the 24th of March. Um, but as Ricardo has already mentioned, the, the, the virus was already spreading quite rapidly across many other countries in Europe. So the, one of the things that we were interested in, in in this report was studying how mobility was changing before the lockdown measures were in, um, introduced in the UK, because clearly the population was, at least to an extent, already widely aware that, you know, COVID was going to be a global crisis. You know, Italy had already entered the lockdown in early March. And in fact, we, you know, when we, when we did uh, the report, so this first analysis, we noticed that um, people uh, started reducing their mobility levels in the UK already before the introduction of uh, lockdown measures by, by the government. So in a way, some sort of self-organized, so people are already aware of, uh, of it or, or yeah, I guess, from other means, I suppose. Yeah, I guess people were already um, getting, you know, well, the, the information was already circulating, you know, online. There's a there's lots of information uh, going on the internet and social media and people were already, I guess, starting to, to think about this a little bit more carefully. There were some early signals by the British government that um, we might um, enter in some form of restriction measures on mobility. So for instance, there was, um, before the actual lockdown measures were introduced, there was uh, a message to try um, to work from home uh, if, if at all possible. And we see in, the, in, the, in our first report actually that when this message was uh, put out, uh, people started reducing their mobility uh, quite a lot, and then once the actual once the actual lockdown measures were introduced, then the mobility dropped by around eighty percent to compared to you know the same period of uh, the previous year. And what was interesting that we we did also in the first report was also looking at you know is this kind of behavior um, similar across the country or is it uh, is it different right. in different parts of the region? Because you know the UK like many countries in the world is quite different countries. So there's like big cities. I mean, London is a huge city, but there's also very rural areas. So we studied how the mobility changed um, across all, all the regions of the UK. And, you know, broadly speaking, I think, you know, people reduce their mobility um, to, to a similar level uh, across all of the UK. Uh, so that includes Scotland, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland as well, other than England. Yes, and uh, here is even, I guess, more prominent those differences there, right? Because we have slightly um, different administrative, um, I guess, independencies there right, between Scotland and Wales. They I mean they have the ability to actually change uh, a little bit the the how they do it, um, the 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 lockdown procedures. And you see, I think they relaxed the lockdown in schools here before uh, Scotland did uh, did something. Ricardo, you and, and Hugo, I guess you've been involved. You talked about the the Italy case, right? That had a, a peak before the UK. Um, I guess Hugo has been involved on, on looking at uh, things in Brazil. Are we seeing similar things? I mean, uh, is this uh, what we see in the UK here? Is it in some way similar to what you guys observed uh, in the other data sets and uh, other countries? Uh, I, can, I can take. So basically, we see very similar trends. Actually, you, everybody can go. There is a couple of websites that, that can show you the trends across many countries. There is the one from the University of Oxford. There is a word, word in data, or there is like a word meter, something that uh, provides you like an over, overview of the number of cases, how that gets spread. Like more, it's more about the counting of the cases. We have to take in consideration that each country has its own policy. So when you analyze this kind of data, especially for the epidemiology point of view and the other groups that are more in this in depth, they're studying more this kind of uh, uh, data. So each country has a very specific way of gathering data and collect information. But overall, there is an emergence of similar trends across country with the, of course, the Delta days, difference of days when the epidemic starts to grow exponentially. 
But uh, across all the world, we see a similar trend in the spreading and how the mobility impact this. So, Hugo, is that, uh, that the same thing with uh, the data in Brazil? Because we've been hearing that Brazil, and of course, you're from Brazil, and me too. So, it's, it's, it's a situation that does not appear to be going that well. So, uh, are they having the same sort of patterns in terms of lockdown procedures? I don't know if Hugo is, uh, is with us. I think that the Hugo is frozen. Oh, okay. So okay. Hugo, <laughs> Hugo left, right? Uh, well, maybe, so... maybe you maybe you can comment a little bit on Brazil since uh, you are. Uh... Well, I mean, I haven't I haven't looked at myself to be honest at the data from from Brazil. I mean, I, I if I comment, it will be based on what we hear on the news. But it seems that uh, the the point that I think is important to be make to to be made here is that we have in our second report some analysis by by social economics, right? So the level of uh, that I guess Hugo will, will talk in a little bit by the, the, the level of income, which somehow ties with the arguments that I guess in Brazil, they were defending the so-called vertical isolation, right? Where you say, well, some people, I guess, if you are from working classes and you have to work to survive, maybe you should be on the streets. And I think our report to a certain extent here in the UK says that Actually, there is, in practice, there is a de facto vertical differences there between, between the social classes, right? So that, that some classes never actually got into lockdown uh, to the same level as, 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 the, as, as the top, as say, the, 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 more, the wealthy, uh, wealthy classes, which shows that there is some sort of inequality already there in the system, even when you're not implementing this vertical isolation. Um, but... So maybe we can, that, that's a good thing for us to actually move into the second report, right? So if we, if we get our host back, uh, I think Hugo seems to get in and out, uh, but maybe we can talk uh, a little bit about the second report. So what was the second report about? So anyone wants to? Yeah. So uh, I can start with the first part of the second report. So uh, at the beginning, basically it was like just uh, after a, a month, we decided to redo the analysis of the radius of duration just to see how has been perceived this lockdown measure, how they did it last. I actually, we see that there was, the lockdown measure was uh, well uh, uh, accepted by the citizens for until the 20, 23 of April. And then there was this, this slowly starting back on the mobility, but not, not at the same level at the, at, as, as before. Our report arrived at the, at the 22 of May and we, saw, and we, we see that the, the mobility is being increased from the lockdown, all about the 20, 25%, but we are still under the 100% of the normal movements around the city. And then- and this, is, this is was before the government, right? So this was before the government yeah. uh, relaxed. So you already start seeing some, some so picking up. So in a sense, people in the same way that Federico was saying that people are getting into the lockdown mode before the government announced, we seen that also people were getting a little bit, I would say tired of it and maybe uh, risking or getting out a little bit more before the government kind of said, hey, yeah. you can go out. I suppose. Yeah, yeah, I think um, that's... Um, um, yeah, sorry. No, no, no. Um, I was just saying that I think that's related also to the fact that other European countries at that point were already starting to re lift some of the lockdown measures, at least yeah. ease them. As I think maybe potentially, you know, the population was seeing that happening and, you know, that was kind of um, not encouraging, but... Um, you know, making the people uh, feel a, a little bit more like they wanted to, to, to resume their, their mobility as, as before. And so they started to, to move a little bit more than when the lockdown measures had just been introduced. Yeah, I'm actually going to just use this time to, to maybe ask, uh, I, uh, maybe some of our students are, are um, online that maybe on the YouTube, they can actually post the link to the reports because we're having some technical difficulties on sharing uh, the screen. So we could actually show uh, the charts here on this conversation, but maybe if people, uh, uh, maybe Mariana or Anna, or Clodomi, uh, Simon, they can, if they could actually share the, the, the link on the, on the YouTube channel, it would be nice for people to actually refer it to. So Hugo, before, before we lost you, we were talking, but I think you came back exactly at the right moment. Uh, we were talking about the second report and this, this fact that We've seen an increase, people picking up their, their, their mobility, right? So moving more. 
uh, which, by the way, I think that is a, a, an idea here for me to ask, Ricardo. We've been saying people move more, move more. What does that mean? Distance or frequency? Uh, sure. Because, I mean, I think more becomes a little vague, I guess, if you people don't understand what... So, uh, what or Basically, report. in order to keep uh, the privacy and uh, everything uh, as we already said, so the idea is like uh, what we check is just only the radius of gelation, what we define the radius of gelation, that is not only like it's a, it's some, a, a measurement of uh, how is, uh, uh, so how is spread your whereabouts. A dispersement, right? Yeah. So how, uh, so how you wander around the city, how you wander around your neighborhood. So it's like, it's a general measure. It's just a distance of a, like, let's say we can say, so approximately we can say, okay, if your radius of gesture is uh, two kilometers, means that during the week, you're going around on average two kilometers. So maybe in these two kilometers, there is your average trip to the, super, to the supermarket or eventually to the work, but we don't have any information of the direction where you go or what you do. That's so the area like, that you, you stay, right? So it's, yes, it's uh, the area that you spend, during, the average area that you spend during the day. Right. And uh, yes, we think, and so for us, we 100% of your mobility, 100% is your stable radius of gyrosphere, so the stable area that you span during the week, uh, during January, at the beginning of January. Uh, and then this is our stay point, this is our uh, baseline. And then we check how, go, uh, how you are uh, decreasing this radius, your whereabouts during the lockdown and after the lockdown. Of course, uh, this relaxing of, um, let's say, movement. So the restarting of taking movement, uh, we don't know if it's due to people that get relaxed or maybe either people that uh, get used to the measurement and understand how uh, move uh, uh, safely. Mm. So I can, so yep. maybe at the beginning there's the scare, they can do not uh, understand how to move safely, maybe wearing mask or like, if I can go, I can go to the supermarket. Yeah, of course you, you can go to the supermarket, something like that. So maybe there is some, there is something else too. There is not only like people that get bored about uh, being closed uh, in uh, lockdown. Yes, basically. Yeah, but so yes, this, this, was... this, this, this actually ties with my, with my, my comment that I was asking. I was going to ask you, Hugo, before, before we lost you, Hugo. I'm happy, yeah. glad to have you back, yeah. which is uh, uh, this, this idea of synchronicity, right? That you, you put on the second report. So we actually mentioned in the beginning that we synchronize and I actually made this joke that, oh, we already know that in the morning we, we have traffic in the evening. But, but you decided to actually measure this. So, so can you comment on, on, on yeah. what that is? Yeah, sorry, I'm having some connectivity issues here. So I think I lost a couple of your questions. But one thing that's important for us to, to mention is that mobility, human mobility is not a um, phenomenon in itself. It's a, um, some sort of a second order phenomenon that is to some extent driven by all the dimensions of what we do. So, for example, when you talk about um, commuting patterns, they are driven by our working schedules, um, by our mobility demands, um, like what time of the day we go to run errands, to, to do groceries. So all sort of like human activities, they, to some extent, they can generate some sort of travel demand for us. Um, and of course, what time of the day these travels are going to happen, they are connected to the, the activity schedules that we have, what are kind of activities we are performing. And one of them, of course, is the well-known synchronization of labor. We uh, humans, as we societies, we, we work together to accomplish things. So we need to go to places um, sometimes or used to, and then, um, we used to go to places to work, but um, work is a collective, it's a social process. And as we tend to move to certain places, certain times of the day, what happens is that um, in addition to how far we are traveling, another important is how many people are traveling at certain time of the day or at the same time. Because it doesn't matter if I'm taking a train from, um, I don't know, from like the south of England to London, if I'm traveling by myself. But what matters is like how many people I'm like in close contact with or I'm being exposed to. 
And the synchronicity that we analyzed is basically that. What mm. time of the day we see more people leaving their areas of residence. So we analyzed basically what time of the day people were traveling um, more than 300 meters away from the area where they live, not of course uh, their uh, homes, but the area where they live and what time of the day like they were traveling and how many people were traveling at the same time within that particular hour. And so are you talking what, about the normal about, circadian rhythms that we have? What, yeah, that what we know is that as we 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 are we synchronize our activities, we tend to do certain things certain times of the day. For example, we tend to um, leave to work around eight something in the morning and come back at the end of the um, early in the evening. And before the pandemic, it's well known is that human beings they have very clear rhythms they tend to go to certain place every day around the same time being it in, uh, in the morning to go to work or to go to school or in, in the evening to go to the gym we tend to do certain things certain times of the day every day or twice a day and what we analyzed was that okay what is this let's say like this pulse of the society or the rhythm of the society how rhythmic is a society or how many people are traveling at the same time and that was our analysis on uh synchronicity synchronicity so we fact, there was a there was a yeah. question on on on, on youtube right and I, maybe i'll bring a uh, feather here on on this uh that i mean still in terms of clarification you were talking hugo about this being a second order effect right so that is a consequence or something else but uh i think sarah was asking us in terms of what other things actually affect what we do and maybe Fede can say something everybody can say something that is so you said work activity but is there anything else Federico is there any other thing that uh, that you think would have affect yeah uh, think, how we do things yeah I think as you know as we've been um, discussing there's quite a lot of different things that can affect you know uh, how we move around and when we move around and why we move around I guess traditionally let's say pre-covid um, you know some of the factors that affect how we move around are things like you know what, where where do I work? Where you know the, the workplace and what kind of job I have, um, what kind of job I have affects you know what, what time I start my my work day and what time I finish my work day. So that's clearly a very important factor. Um, as I guess Sarah was also mentioning in, in the question, you know, different regions are different. It's very different if you live in London, um, and then if you live, for instance, in a rural part of the country, uh, in which maybe you know in order to go to the supermarket in London you just walk for five minutes or get the tube for 10 minutes. Whereas if you live in a rural area, maybe you have to drive for 45 right, right. minutes. So that's a clearly an important factor. But then I guess the, the interesting thing, you know, with the COVID crisis is that another factor that affected um, quite strongly mobility are these, um, let's say non non-pharmaceutical interventions for re reducing the, the, the spread of the virus, which are effectively what you know what we'll be referring to as lockdown measures. So oh, yeah, which is what I guess Hugo was referring to the synchronicity there. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. And think, well, well, oh yeah, sorry, go on, Hugo. Yeah, I think in addition to to the individual level demands, as we are talking about in terms of work study, uh, there's also a social process in terms of like how households they coordinate how they're going to realize certain demands like how the parents they coordinate who is going to bring the the children to the school who is going to pick them up what time they're going to do that how they synchronize what time they leave to work so all those like individual level process they also they have a collective or a social um, dimension as well in which we human beings we we coordinate to to execute and to realize those travel demands and the activity schedules. Yeah, so I think the, the, the interest people uh, could also check. I'm sure there, there's, there's the work of Ciro Catuto uh, on gender. There is the work of Mariana, your PhD student, uh, Hugo, that you guys published recently on, on the gender facts. So there are actually factors. I think a lot of our colleagues and I guess yourselves are looking at different socioeconomic dimensions that actually can lead to differences. Uh, Federico actually pointed out something that's quite interesting, which is uh, uh, the area where we live from the question from Sarah, right? So it's not only rural city, but even within the city, 
right? So if you, you may not have the same level of transportation or linkage, I, I suppose, uh, which forces you to have certain routes. So we are bound, I guess, by the infrastructure that is, is, is around us in a sense, right? So, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Actually, I, I can keep for this because um, if you take in consideration either in, uh, actually in our second report, what we did is just to understand this relation of, uh, of decreasing in mobility together with the, the spatial structure of the area that the people live in. So basically is sparse, dense, is less population, dense population or more dense population. So there is a more sparse household or like more dense one. And if it's in this, if there is any correlation either with the wealth of a neighborhood. So for example, if you check for in London, so London has a lot of mobility because people live around all the cities and that more of them uh, have to commuting to the city center. So they, they have a high radius of duration during uh, the working day. But then uh, we see a very high losing mobility, either if you are in a very dense populated area because you have to travel a lot. And now you will travel only like a few blocks to go to the supermarket. Meanwhile, uh, in an area like uh, Scotland, maybe are uh, more sparse, in, uh, in population. So yes, you are, there is a loss of mobility for your traveling, for your work issues, but still you have to travel a little bit further to reach your supermarket, for example, or either in the countryside in England is the same situation. So this changing mobility give us some information about the area and the resource and the purpose of the people movements, how these are affected and have been affected by the work affect and the impact of the work. So, so given that so many factors, right? If we stay here just a little bit now, I'm, I'm, I'm actually curious on my, uh, my own question, right? So it's, so given so many factors, I mean, different uh, age distributions of the city, different structure, ge geometric structure that I think uh, Gaurav Goshao uh, did with Hugo before, given the gender differences, right? So you have cities that, uh, I guess, due to many factors, for instance, women are not even sometimes allowed to have the same mobility level as men. Can we really do a generalization, right? So has anyone actually confirmed and said, okay, here's the composition of the city. Composition, what I mean is some, some characteristic age distribution uh, structure, and then made a hypothesis that perhaps the mobility in another place would has to be this way because they have similar characteristics and then got that confirmed using some sort of data-driven approach. Is that really, is that something that exists? Anyone um, familiar with this? I mean, well, because, because I'm talking about the generality of the world. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, so sure. we talk about- Yeah, yeah. I, I can, I can um, um, try to start answering this question. It's a, it's a very important question. Uh, we, one thing that for us to keep in mind that we're talking about um, um, human beings that exhibit a broad range of complexities, both, at, as I said before, at the individual level in terms of decision making necessities, but as well as in terms of as, as a society, right? The kind of activities, the complexity of the activities that we, we perform makes it like extremely difficult for us to find universal rules and laws to explain like why and how we move. That said, one thing that but there are certain aspects of human mobility that are universal regardless uh, what kind of society we are looking at, what kind of country, culture, gender. There are certain patterns in terms of like how, what's the, the characteristic travel length for human beings. Um, the radius of duration that we have been talking about, the distribution of radius of duration, um, the temporal regularities as well. So there are many like physical characteristics of human mobility that seem to be universal um, across different countries, cultures, and societies. No, yeah, this is very interesting. So. I'm, I'm kind of becoming conscious of time here and I, I don't want to hold you guys for too long on your Friday evening, right? So, I mean, I couldn't, I can't say that here in the UK it's a lovely evening because it's raining a lot. But anyway, so it's what we used to here. So we can imagine being, or maybe put a background on Zoom being really sunny and <laughs> pretend we are doing, <laughs> doing that. But 
there's changes that we've seen on those reports, right? So I guess I'm going to put a crystal ball and ask you guys to predict the future, right? So we, we've seen the changes in mobility. We see that people are picking up. Do we expect them to go back to where it was? I mean, I, 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 we hear a lot in the news that the world will never be the same as, as before. Um, do you think this will affect and also be, 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 be perceived in the way we move? Perhaps we will move less, right? So because now I'm, I'm, I'm used to buy on the shop just around the corner. So I don't have to go to the big one. So do you think this will happen? That we uh, fundamentally change? I don't think so. I, I think that uh, there's going to be like more um, knowledge for the people, how they move. Uh, there is this, this increasing knowledge of uh, what they used to do and what they do, what they do now. And so maybe there is a, a better understanding. But I don't know how much it's going to last because probably, hopefully, if you were lucky by the end of a year, it's going to come a, vac a vaccine and then uh, COVID will fade away. We don't know if it's going to be a second wave or whatever, but hopefully in the best likely scenario, by the, the beginning of 2021, we'll be like relieved by this uh, problem. Uh, but I think that uh, people will be more aware about the movement, but then I will be back to the normality. Yes, for sure. With more knowledge and uh, yes, maybe it could help, could be this, uh, all this huge problem could be a very good help uh, to fight the environment, to help the green cause of the environment and the global right. changing, you know, and uh, so yes. What do, you an think, what do you yeah, think, What do you think? Yeah, well, I mean, I... I... <laughs> I think broadly speaking, I agree with Ricardo, even though I think that um, there, uh, and I agree that there's going to be um, more, you know, people will have more knowledge um, and think more about, you know, how much they move and how much they fly, you know, about you know, generally about moving. But I think one of the things that, you know, the, this situation has, has shown, and I think that um, people will, will help people realize that actually um, a lot of people can um, relatively, easily um, work from home. So for instance, home working and smart working will probably, in my opinion, at least become not the, the normal practice, but it will become a more accepted and more common practice. Uh, I mean, of course, not everyone can work from home. You know, it depends on many factors. So I don't think everyone will keep working from home forever, but I think it will be a more common uh, practice that people people will do. And therefore, if, if this become more becomes more uh, more standard, uh, you know, this will have an effect on mobility because, of course, people don't have to commute as much. And we have already seen, I think, some cities, even including here in Exeter, that are thinking about, uh, in the short term, how to help with social distancing measures by converting roads to cycle paths. And these measures could be come, uh, well, could be only temporary, but could also be permanent in, in long term, you know, encouraging people to to get cycle more and that kind of right. ties in with what Ricardo was saying as well uh, with, you know, helping the environment and I guess generally the traffic as well. What do you think, yeah, Hugo? I had another um, add on top of what um, Fabrizio, uh, uh, Federico and, and Ricardo said is that um, we have been revolving around the socioeconomic dimension, uh, talking about different aspects. And I think this is one of the, I think the important components for us to discuss is that um, if you look beyond, like the the um, the country, the UK, if you look at like beyond, like certain uh, segments of society, um, I think it's a, it's it's unlikely that uh, things are gonna be like that for too long. Because, for example, it's a it's a it's a small set of areas of human activity that can work from home, can work remotely. Because we have people who have to, we have farmers to have to go to the farms. We have uh, people who have to go to like um, construction workers, yeah, grocery stores, um, and all those things. The as, as we mentioned before, the mobility is the realization of demands. So, but these demands they are going to continue in place, right? So the, even though we still need to, we still need to shop and we still need to eat, and my intuition is that, um, at the, as you both uh, said, is that at the beginning, things might look different, it might be different. But um, as we're going to see in the report is that um, 
it's a privilege. It's a, there is a socioeconomic privilege in terms of social isolation. It's not uh, all social classes that can that have the privilege to isolate themselves. Like when you talk about a country like Brazil, it, it, a country that is very unequal and very segregated, um, the the poorest areas of the country they they cannot isolate themselves because they have to eat. They they work during the day to earn the money that they're going to use to buy their dinner. So um, I think in, in, in midterms, so to speak, um, I think as these demands, they, they keep putting the pressure on the, the, the travel realization. I think we will eventually get back to normal, hopefully with a vaccine that can um, protect us. It's, uh, I think it's going to be quite interesting, right? Because in Ricardo, I think there is more interesting dates and announcements, Federico, that will be made in terms of the opening of the store. So I think people should watch this space on report number three and report number four, uh, because I think it's, uh, uh, I've seen people saying that people will go crazy, right? In a sense, when they open, there will be lines. And I think we've seen this. I don't know if you, if you saw on the news that there were, lines on Ikea, right? And I think I saw reports of kilometers of, of people waiting just to buy some furniture, which, I mean, I don't, personally don't understand. I, I, I have a hard time putting those things together. So, I, I, so I, I'm not sure I'm going to wait for, for three hours just to have some sort of a, a bunch of pieces at home to play with. But, uh, but it might be that people, I've seen people saying, well, people go crazy traveling. Oh, it's been so long that we haven't seen an airplane and we're going to see this rush. So I think it's, it's a very interesting time. And I don't know if you agree for our area because we've gonna, we see phenomena that we may not never see again, right? So this lack of synchronicity, this, this announcements, government interventions, countries that don't have government interventions, right? So if we had access to those, to just to compare, so very interesting times, right? Um, so, well, yeah, I guess um, it was not a question, but I mean, um, <laughs> and maybe maybe Ricardo does not want to write report three or four or something. No, yes, yeah, <laughs> of course, <laughs> of course, we're looking forward to it. Yeah. yeah, I think the next reports they're gonna bring like important insights about what's gonna be the economic um, impact of we like reopening. Um, for travel, so I mean, because I mean, mobility is an important um, driver for uh, dynamic. Yeah, and I can keep from this because in many countries there is a, like the uh, lockdown has been relieved by class of workers. So in this way, hopefully, we can uh, check some uh, impact on this, depending of, uh, of course, economy, economy, and uh, social classes and social interaction. Um, it's, 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 it became apparent this morning, right? So you saw that so with the, the, the economy here shrunk by, by 20% or something, right? So something that has never happened. Yeah. And you can see that the main driver is probably mobility, right? Um, with the main factor that we uh, went through in the, the last few months was not able to go uh, to many places and shows how, how, how important this is to the economy. Guys, yeah. I'm going to try to wrap up. I think, but I will start maybe if uh, some people maybe are listening to this and, and, and maybe later they said, okay, hopefully you say, oh, cool area, right? Well, really nice and I like to do that. So Federico, what do people have to actually study? Right? Right? What do they have to do to, if they want to uh, get involved? Yeah, so that's a, uh, that's a good question. So um, I think, as oh, I guess, as you said, it's, it's, a, it's a very exciting area, in particular at the moment, um, to work in. And it's really a highly interdisciplinary area, as I, I think, you know, this conversation that we had has shown, you know, there's a lot of uh, different aspects and different skills that um, I guess we as a team have all together uh, while working on this. So you know, my background originally, I, I studied uh, physics, but I did a lot of um, also studies in uh, what people call complex systems. So systems that are made of many components, you know, in, in the case of a social study, you know, this could be, you know, lots of people, for instance, moving around. So uh, these complex systems are very, very interesting to study. And that's where uh, the, the kind of area in which I did my, my mm. PhD. But of course, you know, there's a lot of, um, there's a need of a lot of uh, computational skills. Of course, analyzing, working with this data, analyzing this data 
um, requires to be able to, to use the computer and to program the computer to do the analysis um, to do the analysis for you. And then I guess uh, it's crucial also to have the, uh, some knowledge of uh, the methods that you need to analyze this data. So statistics is you know, very important. And you know, we hear a lot in the news over the last you know, few years about you know, machine, machine learning, machines learning right. about uh, you know, different aspects of, uh, for instance, our behavior, our society from the data that, that we all produce. So it's really kind of a combination of many, many different things. Yeah, Ricardo, so you concurred. I mean, were there any skills that you acquired through the years? And um, we'll go, go to Hugo. I don't think I can contribute on that part, uh, uh, to be honest, because I'm, I learned COBOL as a programming language, right? So, so I... So, uh, actually, I started as a physicist, as, a, as Federico, but then I moved a little bit through the economics, but just to understand and to have a grasp of the impact of a human, uh, human interaction. Then uh, this, this depends up to, to the guy that wants to engage with uh, our uh, framework and our uh, subject. But if you want, you can do some transportation analysis uh, or uh, you can do, you can tackle this from uh, our point of view now that we are a computer science uh, department. So we are more uh, uh, centered on the data science. And so we take this data and we try to get information from that. And we can do using statistics tools or machine learning tools and uh, gather this information can help us to provide new metrics. And then uh, with these new metrics, of course, you need a little bit to need to focus to other disciplines because you have to talk, you have to talk with a, a sorry, with, a splash, with a spatial planner or geographer, or maybe the researcher that do epidemiology to provide them some uh, features, some metrics. So you need to have a, a, a wider knowledge, at least uh, to talk with this uh, other actor because it's a very complex environment. But then you can decide the path of, com of uh, uh, computer science that would be good or like uh, come from physics, but then you have to work a lot about coding because there are big data in this case, and we're working for that. Uh, we're working with that. So it's like, yes, this much. Here you go. Anything you want to add? Yes, I agree with them. It's that like nowadays, um, these data-driven approaches, they are, uh, very um, intensive in terms of coding data analysis skills. But there's one important dimension as well. I think it's important for us to acknowledge that um, we are talking about social systems and socioeconomic systems. And it's, it's, it's crucial for us if we want to have a better understanding of these systems, for us to understand the, like the, the, uh, the literature in the social sciences and the humanities in in economy to, because there is like more than a century of scientific literature about human mobility in, in demography and social sciences. So it's important for us to, especially to guide our computational strategy is to have an understanding of what's happening. What is a society? What is, what are the social pressures? What are the economic pressures? And it's important for us, like coming from the um, from the computer science and physics, for us to be humble, to like to drink from the, the these other sources as well, from and to be open-minded to read the literature and see what people have been doing. And because I think if we we want to contribute to a better understanding of these systems, and we can contribute. I think it's important for us to um, start from what, what like these other areas have done already. Right, so right. Sorry. Yeah. To, to summarize, in addition to like the computer science, physics, um, um, transportation geography, it's important for us to also study social sciences, economy, uh, demography, and so on. Yeah, ab ab absolutely. So embrace the, the multidisciplinarity here of the field uh, uh, completely, right? So I'm going to do also say that uh, people interested in now is my shameless advertisement, right? We know that as a group, we are trying to put together perhaps for next year some sort of a program in Exeter in, in urban systems and urban analytics. So that might be a way and maybe in that program, we will have all those, those dimensions, social dimension, engineering, machine learning, uh, physics, um, so that people can actually get into it. I, I really appreciate you guys 
are joining. So I will I'll finish here, but I go around to see the last words from from everyone. But again, thank you very much, and thank you for the people who um, stayed online on YouTube, um, the brave people who perhaps uh, didn't have a better thing to do on, on on Friday. But anyway, I'm joking. So I'll go around and start with uh, I guess Hugo. You can start, and then I'll finish with with with, with Fede. So any last words before we, we say goodbye? Yeah, um, I can start that. I want to um, first thank you, Ronaldo, for inviting us to join this nice talk. It's an opportunity for us to discuss a little bit of our findings. And um, I think my, um, I want to wrap up this talk is that we, we are facing a very critical moment in terms of um, as a society we and uh, we don't know yet what are going to be the consequences of that in, in in the long term but one thing that uh, for me is very clear at this moment is that we we have to take care of ourselves um, in terms to prevent us and to like from not only from um, getting contact with the virus but also um, in terms of our well-being as well, or, uh, like, or healthy. And I think um, as we are in a moment that we are starting to move towards opening um, back to the mobility, I think this is an opportunity for us to reflect on, um, like, what's going to, do you want to go back to the normal that we had before? Like, if you look at, like, societies in terms of inequality, in terms of, um, segregation, even mobility segregation. Um, I think it's an opportunity for us to reflect on what's gonna, what is the new normal that we want to have, and and, and maybe to change like um, the way we do things to at least take some steps towards this direction. All right. Thank you. It's very, very. I agree completely, uh, Ricardo. Yeah, I'm, I really agree with, with uh, what, what just Hugo said. And then, yes, take this opportunity, this future that uh, is uh, open a possibility, it's full of possibility, and uh, eventually decide the uh, one thing that you can go ahead. That you don't need to be overwhelmed about uh, all this project and take all this uh, stuff that the world is sending to us. Just uh, try to do something that can change your life in the future a little one, maybe you want to do more green, you want to do a better, you want to do more in like a more social uh, help or like uh, something in uh, any direction. You said one little uh, battle that you can fight and then you can help to improve the world and then improve yourself because it's always like an improvement of ourselves. So we take these two more, three months of self-isolation, somebody of us start to do some hobbies, somebody start uh, to learn a lot. And maybe there will be not very good time for the economies to go, uh, go ahead. We don't know if it's gonna recover very fast or it's gonna recover a little bit slower, but maybe there is some possibility to come back to study, study to uh, and learn something new or eventually to focus and to gather new experience. So try to do not uh, be uh, overwhelmed by the future, but try to a little bit use this as an opportunity and stay safe and uh, Thank you yeah. for your time and to right. be with us. I appreciate that, Fede. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with what uh, both Hugo and Ricardo have said. I think they've said that a lot of the things that, um, that I also feel in that, and I was thinking um, of saying. And I think one aspect that, that I guess both Hugo and Ricardo mentioned that, you know, is, is a particularly unprecedented situation. And I think there's, a, there's still a lot going on and, you know, we, the situation is still difficult and, you know, it, it will take a while to, um, to, to get better. And I think there's still lots of things that we need to understand. I think one thing that Hugo said I think is very important is that you know, there's a lot of talking about how, because it's kind of the priority, I guess, to how, you know, how we can reduce the virus and everything and help the economy as well. But I think one thing which is also going to be incredibly important in the kind of coming months is also how, you know, this whole situation has not only affected our economy and our physical health, but also has, has affected our mental health and well-being mm -hmm. with people having to have suddenly changed their lives drastically, not being able to see family for you know months, for instance, and not being able to see friends for months. And so I think this is also a very important aspect that um, will will come into play in the in the in the next few months. All right. Well, well said, everyone. So I appreciate.
Uh, last thing, if everybody, if anyone has questions about the report, I uh, encourage them to write to Ricardo. His email address is on, on, on the report there. We're happy to answer more questions. And who knows, maybe we'll do another conversation. I, I personally enjoyed it. It was really nice. Really nice. Um, so it's kind of uh, informal. So maybe when Ricardo allow us to do the report for something, then we, we have another one. All right. All right, guys. Have a good weekend. Okay. Of the of the video, so ah uh, yes, yeah, they're on the video description. Yes, you're right. Yeah. There are all the links yeah. to the report on the YouTube. All right. So, all right, guys. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Have a good.